changed. I've been changed. I've been changed. I've been changed. I ate algae. I started and good afternoon again, everyone. Um, my name is Akima, and I'm really excited to be here, especially for this particular panel, because as we all know, youth are our future, correct? Right. And so youth programs, as well as those youth leaders, are very key in the work that we're trying to do if we want to really see any um, sustainable changes in our planet and our behaviors and or just our relationships. And so without any further ado, I'm going to give each panelist a chance to uh, talk for maybe three to five minutes, and you'll have your time shown to you up here. But if you could kind of introduce us to who you are, kind of what your vision is, what your actions are, three to five minutes. And we can start, start with the youngest person on the panel. I'm just going to jump out there and assume Jerome is the youngest. Would you like to go first, Jerome? Okay. Um, I'm 17 years old, and I just give a speech here. <laughs> um, I'm the founder and executive director of a national youth voting organization called One Million of Us, and I also climate strike every single Friday in front of the White House, um, advocating for the Climate Change Education Act and the Green New Deal. Um, and the work I do at One Million of Us is working to mobilize one million young people to register and turn out to vote in the next election. And it's nonpartisan, it's a nonprofit organization. And we're working within the five major youth social movements, um, which is gun violence, climate change, immigration reform, gender equality, and racial equality, making sure that we're building those intersections between the youth movements to make sure youth are empowered, educated, and informed about the next election, giving them the resources and training in order to be able to be a part of the elections. Um, I've been a climate activist since I was five years old, and my parents um, allowed me to basically explore the forest in my backyard. And ever since then, um, I've been a middle schooler, basically being the only like weather kid, like talking about global warming when it was like super unpopular, and everyone was like, climate change isn't real. And now everyone's like, okay, now I understand. <laughs> and it's now been thanks to like the Green New Deal and with um, AOC and Greta Thunberg and these major figures in the climate movement, there's so much more um, awareness of climate change. And it's just amazing to see how young people are being um, rising up in the movement. And to see this panel of amazing people here, it's great to be a part of it. Um. Hi, my name is Cameron Fagans. Uh, I'm an education aide at the National Aquarium. And what I do at the National Aquarium, a majority of what I do is work with a program called What Lives in the Harbor, where we take sixth grade students from all around Baltimore City, and we actually test the water quality that we find in the Baltimore Harbor. So a lot of what we do is getting them involved in their own watersheds, and we test the dissolved oxygen salinity, temperature, and pH, and things like that. So I said I'm an uh, education aide at the aquarium. Sorry, a little nervous. Uh, but what I started out what, what I started out as was an intern, and I got my internship through an opportunity. And that's one thing I just want to talk to all of you about. And I got that opportunity through a professor who saw something in me, and that led me to my um, my boss up there, Simone. She spoke earlier, and that opportunity gave me the chance to do something bigger than what I thought I was going to do. So right now, it's an honor to be able to speak in front of all of you. It's an honor to be able to do what I do every day. And I just wanted to tell you all that opportunity is something that is wonderful. It's something that when opportunity presents itself to you, you need to go out and grab it. Because a lot of times when we see opportunity, we don't go and get it. It scares us because it's something that might not be what we want it to be. So as well as you need to go out and grab your opportunities, you need to give opportunity as well. Because I know everyone here knows somebody who knows something, and there's always a point at which you can give somebody something. So a little off topic from, well, I just want something I wanted to say. But um, and I more so wanted to say with my work, that I do at the aquarium. Every day I feel enriched and fulfilled, teaching people more about conservation and the things that actually affect them. Because as people of color, one thing that we do not, that we do not think about as we get older is our environment. 
because that's not something we're taught to think of, we're taught to think about. So seeing the expressions of the kids that I work with and seeing how they react when they learn about their local watershed and things that they can do to make the that things they could do to make the environment better is something that actually like warms my heart. So it makes going to work something great. And I think that's kind of all I want to say. Yeah. Hi, I'm Benita D, president and founder of STEAM Onward. It's a youth organization that works to get more youth of color, minority and underserved youth in careers in STEM. And of course, because uh, of our community, it has to be STEAM, which the A is the arts. Um, this organization was founded basically on demand by young people I was working with who were saying, yeah, black history programs are very nice, or Latin history programs, that's really nice, but we need jobs, we need careers, we need good paying jobs, let's go into STEM. So they kind of forced us grown-ups to go back and look at how we could support young people. At the time we started, we realized that there were so many young people uh, so many people in our community, they were dying of cancer, uh, probably environmentally related diseases, all kinds of illnesses, and we kind of started there. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my personal history. I come from a family of farmers. Uh, my great-grandfather was a horse trainer. Uh, he trained hunting dogs, and he was a very successful farmer after slavery in the Rock Hill, South Carolina. Uh, he also had a dance band. And that dance band would travel around the South, uh, doing what my grandmother called calling sets. She said the white folks called it square dancing. <laughs> Probably know it. And uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather, died at an early death, and my grandmother took over the farm, raised ten children, farm hands, and and raised. Uh, uh, crops and supported her family. They were able to educate one child, and that one child was the pride of the family. In the South, farmers were considered the most successful of a black community because they were able to send their children to college, and that's how they measured wealth, one of the ways. They said the children were educated, they were highfalutin, and that was the proof of your success as a parent that you could send your children to school. So in my family, I was taught a lot about the farm and the pride of these, these workers, but I was also talk, talked about, uh, learned about the wild fruit that grew in the woods around the farm, how good it tasted, the, the berries and the persimmons, and there was a love of that farm, the streams that ran through it, that were taught to me as a very small child. So uh, I found myself doing this work with the young researchers, and uh, people ask me questions like, how is it that you spend your life, you see I'm not the youngest member of the panel, uh, you spend your life trying to connect young people with their land and the future. And the way I do it is the way I did with you just now. I told you a story that connected me to my land. And what I asked our young people to do is to go back and ask the elders some simple questions. Now I start with what did grandma do or grandpa do if you fell and scraped your knee? Or if you were sick and you got a cold? Let's talk about the remedies and the treatments they used. Let's start those conversations. And sometimes, you know, they have to go back a few generations. But that knowledge of traditional medicine, traditional foods, things that grew wild that healed people is something that our, our ancestors knew and somehow we've lost. So I'm asking young people to try to regain that knowledge, start those intergenerational conversations as a way to get in touch with their roots. After all, many times what you find is that once you talk about farming or agriculture or working for free, people are real big on asking black kids to work for free. People are caught in that slavery thing. They're thinking about, yeah, you already got generations of free labor out of my ancestors. Now you come and ask me to work for free? So there's, there's, some, there's some real problems there. Other people have addressed it over the day over the day's uh, activities, that there's a lot of pain and suffering around hard work. If you can talk about pride, 
Think about the Black Power Movement. Wasn't it all about pride and history and knowing your roots and knowing yourself? The more you know, the more you're empowered to do for yourself and to do for your community and make a difference. So um, I think that's my time, right? I'm good. I have more time? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, if I have a little bit more time, let's talk about the whole process of how you talk to your parents. So, or your grandparents, or whoever in your family. That's an interview process. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some really good friends here, University of Maryland, who's taught us some techniques like photo voice, story mapping, some ways to begin to do research. Uh, also, our program provides internships and, and study opportunities with the health department at the local hospital. And we go out in the community and we ask questions. So one of the things they learn over time is those questions that you learn to ask can turn into real science. They can turn into the work that, that scientists and uh, uh, epidemiologists use to gather data. The more information we have as a community, the more science we bring to it, the more it empowers us to be able to advocate for the health of our community. You know, if there's an environmental site, you know, let's learn to use an air beam. What can we do to gather data and create and, and to examine our own um, intelligence, unique intelligence that we have within our community? So uh, I really strongly suggest that um, we further engage young people in the study of uh, interview and, and examining history uh, so that they will have pride in what they do and they will feel that their history and their legacy belongs to them and they want to invest their time and their energy in it. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Isaiah Lucas, and uh, firstly, I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. Um, I see that we are many in body, one in mind, you know, no matter how far or, or how uh, close that you live to this place and traveled. I just want to thank you so much for coming out, and I'm truly, as a youth, inspired by you all here today. So can we just give ourselves a round of applause, please? Thank you. All right, so yeah, I, um, I'm actually from New York City. I just recently moved down here. Yeah, yeah. New York! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm an aspiring, um, aspiring hip hop artist. I, I do rap, conscious uh, spoken word. And um, I'm also part of a, an organization um, called SGI uh, USA. And um, we have a website, SGI.org, where uh, our environmental cause is the uh, abolishing of nuclear weapons by 2050. And um, I'm also an intern at Steam Onward, which is why I'm here today with the wonderful leadership of Ms. Benita Adib and her husband. Um, you know, I really uh, want to uh, dedicate this to them because, you know, without them, I would have never learned of how to make an impact in my environment. And so, um, yeah, just growing up in New York City, um, I was an unfortunate victim of environmental racism, environmental injustice. And I grew up looking like the lead paint on the walls. And there was um, always, I never understood why not, we sh I shouldn't lick the lead. I mean, the walls, and my parents would always say there's lead in them. I didn't understand that as a young kid. I just knew it tasted good. And you, know, um, you, you can imagine how many uh, kids were suffering in Flint, Michigan, with these types of problems as well. And so uh, just relating to that, you know, all across the uh, board in, in um, unfortunate uh, poverty-driven uh, neighborhoods, um, I, I realized that um, I was really... Uh, trying to better myself when I got a little bit older, better my health, and really educate people about these uh, awareness issues that kids aren't aware of. And um, I really found that uh, moving to Southern Maryland and um, finding Mr. Deeb and the, um, the organization called YRCP, which is the Young Researchers Community Project, and um, that's based in Charles County. And uh, we, we, we really go all over Southern Maryland just trying to make change. And... Um, our, our motive is just like, you know, people can talk, people can always uh, think about all the things they want to do, but what's most important is we take action, we actually start doing things, and you know, so being a uh, social activist and environmental justice major, I'm a sophomore in college, by the way, the College of Southern Maryland, um, we really embody that mission, and we have something we call FEEN, which is uh, fitness, um, environment, economics, and uh, nutrition. And so, uh, yeah, the fitness part, we really go out and we do, in we do walks, uh, walks for uh, cancer, walks against anti-vaping and tobacco coalition. Um, and we do um, a lot of, like, education and, you know, how important it is to be fit, you know, how to go outside, you know, go for, like, a 
person said earlier today, go for a mile a walk once a day at least, or be active, go to the gym, do sports. And um, uh, we do, envi well, of course, we're environmental justice focused. Um, and we, uh, we do, do two things. We try to um, teach people about our waterways and um, teach people about how to be healthier and how to grow their own food. And uh, we, ac we actually recently have come up uh, with this falls in line with the nutrition, uh, something called uh, Nature's Revival Line pro pro Project, or Nature's Revival Line Product. And um, what we're doing is, and it's also ties into economics, is we're all like little entrepreneurs creating our own businesses, selling uh, natural herbs that grow native to Southern Maryland, as well as um, native herbs to your traditional cultures. So we've categorized these herbs for, by uh, Native American herbs, African herbs, uh, Hispanic, um, Indian, and Asian herbs. And uh, we go out into our communities, churches, any places, uh, uh, public places, and we um, go out there and we sell these um, products. But we not only sell them for cosmetic use, uh, traditional use, and uh, culinary use, but we teach people how they can um, feed their own selves and how to grow their own food and really do away with all these, um, you know, toxic fast food uh, places. They're always going out and eating uh, unhealthy meals and making unhealthy decisions for their lives. And so, um, yeah, we also do oyster gardening, which is uh, uh, in line with the Chesapeake Bay. And, you know, we've learned how to uh, build predator-proof cages for the oysters. We learned that oysters filter about 50 gallons of water. So um, we're not playing around with our bay. You know, we really want to help restore it. We've dug eight-inch holes repeatedly, uh, which is a great uh, activity to do with other people and uh, other youth. And, um, and we dig these eight-inch holes to install rain gardens, which also help with water runoff and help with uh, restoring the bay as well. And so, um, yeah, that's essentially what we are is uh, YRCP and uh, STEAM Onward. I say quality, you say matters. Quality matters. Quality matters. matters. I say quality, you say matters. Quality matters. Quality matters. matters. It matters indeed, without question. Um, good afternoon. My name is Broderick Clark. I'm the Youth Education and Policy Coordinator with Prince George's County Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, that's who's uh, paying the bills today and has me sitting here in this seat. Uh, on the other side, or other life, um, I'm a field consultant for the Weikert Center for Youth Program Quality based out of Ypsilanti, Michigan. And a couple other clients I have in my portfolio include the National Summer Learning Association, the National Institute on Out of School Time. And so in my three minutes um, that I have to, to just chat with you for a little bit, just want to talk about what our priorities are uh, relative to um, this work. We know that it's super important for us to be um, a professional learning community. Anybody ever been part of a professional learning community before? All right. Anybody ever work in a dysfunctional work environment? Ooh. All right. All right. I'm not saying where you work at right now. I'm not saying that. But um, you know, we're committed to quite the opposite of dysfunction. We're committed to challenging one another, to being great. Uh, we have a new director in place who gave us the challenge the other day to move from um, being good uh, to great, and we know that that's going to take a lot of energy, time, and effort. And so with a relentless focus on program quality, uh, we feel like uh, we have the tools to get there. It really begins with challenging one another to be great and to be successful, uh, to implement the things that we know are in the best interest of children and families. Uh, we've been studying this stuff as a community for a long time, and so if we know better, we should do what? Better. If we know better, we should do better. And I, I know that I'm around a bunch of committed folks that's committed to doing better. So if you uh, work for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, could you please throw your hand up real quick? Just got to give you all a shout out. Appreciate y'all for being here, mm -hmm. without question. <laughs> we know en route to, to making that move from good to great um, that we're going to focus on keeping young people safe. Everybody say safe. Safe. Hey. All right. We keep young people safe by making sure that they're physically safe, but also on making sure that they don't only feel safe, but they are safe. And we do a really wonderful job at doing that. Uh, that's where some of our six gold medals come from. Um, I mentioned that because, you know, it could be a blessing and a blessing. And I'm saying blessing and a blessing, not blessing and a curse, because I'm rebuking the curse and just considering it all a blessing, right? When you're doing great, you know, it's one thing to be great, it's another thing to stay there. And so we're committed to doing that through positive youth development. The other piece is um, supportive environment. Everybody say supportive environment. Supportive, supportive environment. environment. We want to make sure that our folks all feel supported and that they know that they are supported. We make sure that when we're working with children and families that uh, we're providing an example, we're modeling constantly. 
Uh, we're providing access to resources, um, critical resources for some, uh, resources that they already pay for through their tax dollars. Sometimes it's, hey, you know you already paid for that gym that's right there at that rack across the street. Like, let's go get it in, get outside. Uh, make it happen, connect with our green spaces. Uh, you know, we don't have to worry about access because we own a lot of land uh, without question. Uh, we're stewards of that and we take that very seriously. We support folks uh, through making sure that we participate alongside them. So not just saying this is what you should be doing or this is how you can do it, but going out and modeling and, and doing these things alongside them. The other piece is interaction. Everybody say interaction. Interaction. We want to make sure that when we're putting people together that we're being intentional about putting people into cooperative groups. We might even build in things like interdependence. And so making sure that if five students are working on a project, all of them have to put their energy, effort, enthusiasm, and passion, and, and sweat equity into it so that we can achieve the end result. And then once again, modeling that uh, with our talented staff at the same time. And of course, it's about getting to the top of the pyramid. Everybody say engagement. Engagement. We want to make sure that people experience the full experiential learning cycle. We know that young people are talented. We want to make sure that they plan what they do, do what they do, and reflect on what they've done as a result. Uh, what I neglected to mention, which is at the foundation of all this work, uh, is youth voice. And so I'm super humbled to be up here with some, some amazing young leaders, without question. Uh, this is a living manifestation of what we're promoting in our agency right now, putting young people out front with all the support that they need to be able to shine and thrive. Because, you know, you see what happens when you give them that platform for possibility, what they're able to do with it. If you look at all the movements that have existed, you see young people at the front. You look at the civil rights movement, you see young people at the front. You see Tiananmen Square, you see young people at the front. You see this EJ movement, you see young people at the front. Everybody, let's say, bring young people to the front. Bring young people to the front. Well, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> so as we all know, we are living in a different day and time now. And, you know, the same challenges, like my, I grew up in the 70s, so, you know, me coming up was a different time than it is now. There's a lot more distractions, um, a lot more um, things for, for youth to fall into that may not be positive and productive for them. Can you give specific examples of something you do to make your work relatable that actually lets you know that the youth are connecting to what you're trying to do. Because it's not an easy job engaging youth consistently enough to really make change. You know, not just a one-time thing, but you give me an example of something you're doing that one, lets you know that you're successful, but that, you know, something that stuck out in your mind where you've been able to impact the youth and what do you think it was that you did that made you relatable? Um. I think that one of the things that um, I've done over the years is, well, one of the um, most recent things is that I was able to intern for Congressman John Lewis, and there I actually was able to understand how much power we actually have, and, and communicating that to young people, and saying that, like, if you intern in any congressional office, you understand that, like, when you make a call to your representative, you have, like, a really big impact when you call them, because you have, like, 30 to 40 calls that you get a week, I mean, a day, and it's about a, a single issue or about different issues. And when you have 10 people in this audience just call one member of Congress, you have a huge impact on that member for that entire day, or in that span of two or three days. And when you continue to do that over and over again and communicate to young people that you have so much power in calling a member of Congress or showing your face in the office and just walking in and saying, hi, I want to talk to you about climate justice for five minutes, and just communicating that this is important to you, and that if you take the time to visit their office, they in internally say they have the ability to go to the polls, and that if they're taking the time to go see you, they're going to take the time to go to the polls and vote for you or not vote for you. And just communicating to young people how the, the scale, scope, and speed of the climate crisis, but also pathways to actually um, take your power back and communicate to elected officials, the elected representatives to show how, how much power young people have. Because we elected those people in office and they have to truly represent us. And when you talk about policies and know the policies that your elected official has supported or not supported, it gives you so much power to go and talk to them about why they haven't supported it and what, what steps they can take to do that. And um, some of the things that, um, that I've seen over the past couple of months is that young people who have not, know nothing about climate change, one of the things that empowers them is seeing other young people going out and striking or going out and seeing them that, showing that climate justice isn't something that's nerdy or geeky, but it's something that's like important that they need to be a part of. And just um, creating that entryway with climate strikes or with events like this where they can come out and see um, young people on, like on this panel talking about the importance of young people being at the forefront is 
um, really empowering. So I think empowering them and telling them about the importance of getting educated about the climate crisis, and then telling them, call a member of Congress, um, going out to climate strikes, and just joining organizations that are doing cleanups in like Ward 8 or Ward 7 to show how we're cleaning up our own communities. Yeah. Uh, give it up for the brother, please. <laughs> And so I'll just share six words in 60 seconds. Um, the three things that I think um, really help to establish a genuine connection with young people is eliminate and bias judgment and assumption from your conversations with them all together. Um, it really is the kryptonite of that um, bonding process with young folks. The other three that I'll share um, that I believe are critical in terms of establishing relationships with young people is that you need to be honest, you need to be genuine, and you need to be authentic. You've always heard about young people having the radar. They can tell that if you're being fake from down the block. And that's really just a self-preservation mechanism. You know, Brooklyn runs deep. New York runs deep up on this uh, panel without question. And you don't survive that concrete jungle without having some survival things that come into play. Um, so they can tell when you're being genuine. Be authentic. Don't use their language if you don't understand how it's to be used in the right context. You know, all of those things. You know, it took me a while before I said lit. And by the time I learned how to say lit in the right context, that wasn't even lit anymore. <laughs> so, you know, understand youth culture without question. Study it the same way you study other things. And then approach those young people with a servant heart. Be honest. Don't approach them with judgment. Be authentic and genuine. Thank you. Um, I think uh, one of the tools I have in my, uh, there's actually two. One is the seed. What I found out is a simple seed and some water and some soil, with that a child can create a miracle in a very short period of time. I take, take radishes or even sorrel. It'll come up in three to five days. And once you put something very simple in a child's hands and they can watch the power of nature, it, if you did that, look, what else can you do? Another tool we use is a development of a campaign. Uh, if it's something you believe in, then you should be able to do something about it. So we teach you a structure of a campaign, as research, talking points, then they develop a zine, which is a one-page magazine, then skits, a poem, or a way to communicate and teach that information. And uh, at this point, most everything is turning into a social media campaign. When you say, we push it out there to get feedback. And I think it's very important uh, for people to see that they can be a, tra a change agent, but they actually have some real skills that they can list and name, that they can prove to themselves and the community that change is not impossible. It's doable. All right, there's no more questions um, from me at this point. Does anyone in the, pan uh, in the audience have any questions? You look like you have a loud voice. You want to try it without the mic? <laughs> mm-hmm. that are coming from college going into the workforce and be more supportive? Show up. <laughs> um, we're busy. I, there's some people in here who've done a lot of uh, volunteering and helping out youth. They need to see able-bodied people show up and, and show them that they're, what they're doing is worth the time of adults. So I think if you come and you spend a few minutes, I can think of some amazing things that have happened to this young man just recently. Just because an adult took the time to show up, and he took the time to show out, <laughs> and he can do I wish he could do some rap for you, but you know, just to show you what he's accomplished and how you know our young people are sponges, but we need to give them an opportunity to show us what they've absorbed. So um, Dead Poet Society is one of my favorite movies, um, and this idea of carpe diem and season the moment or season the day is super, super critical is one of my mantras. Uh, and I know that there's a, a lot of brothers I'm seeing in the room 
Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to give a challenge to the brothers that are in the room because many times that I end up in places and spaces, um, I'm the only brother in the room. Mm. And, um, you know, especially when you start talking about nonprofit leadership and, you know, when you, you know, uh, folks that ascend to those leadership positions, providing guidance and support, but their constituents, you know, are largely uh, black and brown folks. And so um, you got to be present. You know, this field is nurturing. This field is loving and all of that. And I know sometimes it's not the first pick, um, you know, for, for guys and dudes, but uh, I would encourage us to step up to the plate and be visible, show up to that school, show up to that rec center, show up to that after school program. You know, we don't just play basketball. You know, there's other things that, and other places and spaces where you don't need a whole lot of permission to show your face and show that, you know, you know, you, you have something to add and something to share, um, something to model, particularly for these young cats, the little hoppers I heard them call, um, <laughs> that are certainly influenced by the longest standard out of school time program, which is the street. Mm -hmm. In the street, they feel safe, they feel supported, they put in situations to learn and lead. And the question is, are we ready to step up and put them in situations where they can learn and lead in a safe place? All right. We have a question all the way up in the back. So I wanted to ask the students, the young folks on the panel specifically, we're talking about you a lot, but so what do you look for in an opportunity? What makes you pick an opportunity to get out and get involved, particularly with like, you know, what makes you want to hang out in the environment with like an old white lady like me? Like what um, is the benefit you're going for that we can try to provide? for other folks like you? Um, I would say the benefit would be making a change and making a difference. And sometimes it's hard to see where that change and that difference can be made, but when you can see it, it's something that you want to jump at. So seeing the impact that you can make, sometimes it can spark a fire that will make you want to go out and be the best you can be at whatever it is. Oh. I just wanted to, it's good. Hey, yes. Yeah, just piggybacking off of that, um, I personally look for, um, so, you know, I had, um, I have a lot of illness in my family. My mother has uh, stage four breast cancer. Uh, a lot of it mostly probably due to the asbestos undetected and um, not accounted for when I call uh, about it. And um, so I'm always in a state of like, I must improve this planet, and I must improve this world. You know, nobody should go through this because I've experienced so much uh, trauma due to these um, injustices. So when I see um, anybody, whether you're black, brown, green, I don't care what color you are, I don't care where you're from, if you have the same type of heart I do, I see that you're trying to make change in this world. My first thought is like, you know, like he said, seeing if you're real, seeing what you're about, seeing how I can learn from you, you know, not just how you can learn from me. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a youth, I'm seeking, and I really want to make change in this environment, in this world. So, like, I get ecstatic when I see uh, diverse people uh, coming together for the same cause. And so I just tell myself, like, yeah, let's, let's get together and let's really accomplish, you know, these amazing things. Let's climb these mountains. Let's take down these tyrants and change this world. So, yeah. I'll offer really quick. Um, I'm 49 years old, so I'm not a young person anymore these days. But uh, young people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just hold on to that. Yeah, and I think that adding on to that, it's I think young people are really, we like it, um, opportunities in any space, but I think that um, what really brings value to it is when you make it available to make sure that we're in our own community helping the people that are around us and that we're helping um, our other classmates or helping um, people that we see that need the help. And I think that that's really important and that um, we're just going into the same place helping the same um, demographic. It's just like we got to help everybody. We got to make sure we're, we're spreading the love. And that's really what we look for in our community is to be able to help, help our brothers and sisters as well. Um, so with all of the great experience that you guys have had and all of the knowledge that you've learned in your, your short years here, 
what can you guys give to another young person? Like, what advice or knowledge can you share with another young person that is possibly at this point in their life where they're questioning where do they want to go in terms of this environmental movement? What is something that you can kind of um, share with them to let them know that um, that there is a path for them and what you know what what they can expect and potentially some advice for them as they navigate through it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that like what advice you would give to young people is to educate yourself about the climate crisis. And like for me, I, I started in social media and then I started doing journalism. I started doing photography, like technology, and now I'm doing activism, more like direct activism. And like there's so many pathways. But I think when you just tell them about the pros and cons, just educate them about that and just giving them the ability to educate themselves, it allows them to be able to be such bigger players in this movement. Like, some of the biggest activists came from like art and came from like music and came from so many different diverse backgrounds and all came to the environmental movement. And when they had that passion and then came to the environmental movement, it was really, it was really special to see what they were doing because they loved what they were doing. They weren't just doing something because that was the only opportunity they saw. They saw it because they were able to educate themselves about it, then say, this is what I want to do specifically in the environmental movement, and then they start pursuing that. So I think just giving them the resources, they'll just, we'll, we'll fly wherever we want to go. <laughs> Yeah, so I will say I've, I've actually had um, a lot of my friends from back in New York uh, ask me, you know, you know, what in the world are you doing, you know, in Waldorf with trying to take on environmental, what the heck is that, environmental justice, you're supposed to be a rapper, basketball, player, you know, they'll just go off on a tangent, and so I always tell them the same thing, and that's just like, you know, just take us time to uh, sit down and open your eyes and really um, look to see, like, you know, where we came from, you know, our ancestry, um, you know, the traditions, the culture, the art. This is all part of an environmental movement, you know, the geography, every, all these things play a part. And so when I tell kids about, like, you know, things like art and the exciting things that you'll find when you go into, like, the sciences, which is a very growing, uh, big growing field, and, um, you know, a lot of money does come with it, but it's not about the money. Of course, that it will attract the youth. But when you are uh, just really showing them, like, uh, the different things, how you're making a change in the world, how you're improving and saving lives, and how you're um, combating, like, the situations that you were born in and that you grew to, uh, to learn and really uh, just adapt as, like, bad habits. And so, yeah, just really uh, showing people, like, you know, I just recently, just by making myself uh, present and um, coming to all these uh, YRCP meetings, I uh, got an internship with um, the Chesapeake Bay Laboratory, and uh, we learned how to do, um, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> and there was this big thing going on about uh, coral reefs and how, um, they're, you know, how, why they're dying off and if sunscreen affects them, and they actually got to the point where they banned sunscreen in Hawaii. And so um, I was part of a huge project to show people like, hey, you know, we need to take a deeper look, you know, and just because some one scientist says, let's ban sunscreen, we need to see like, you know, not take that one person's word for granted, but do our own research. And so we went out and we uh, were testing like the uh, oxyobenzate and different chemicals that are in sunscreen on the coral reefs. And uh, we come to find, like, you know, there was no need to ban them because there was an inefficient effect on the coral reefs. But what was the bigger problem was climate change, nuclear, nuclear power plants that are warming the waters. And unfortunately, when the temperatures change like that, they kill oysters and corals. And so uh, different things like this that help, like, you know, do away with unjust laws that are made from, from some guy that just wants to boast his ego and are really killing people. You know, when students, I think when, when youth really see, like, they have the power to save lives, that's going to get them on board no matter what, you know. And I, I think a big part of, the, of that as well is our arts program. We also have a, a Charles County Got Talent um, a talent show coming up on May 2nd. And... Um, we really reach out to youth in these uh, wonderful activities. And um, a big thing is like music and, and, um, and artistry. When you really push that message of, um, you know, reconnecting to your roots, uh, connecting with nature, you know, the betterment of the environment and the planet as a whole, that, that will subconsciously shift the entire youth. Because we, we've seen the world get this way through uh, cultural movements like that. And we've seen the world change through cultural movements like that. So, um, yeah, that's always my advice, you know, just sharing with them the different opportunities that I've had, not just to make money, but to change the world. Yeah. All right. What a great way to end. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we're at the end of this panel, but I'd like to personally thank Benita, Broderick, Cameron, Jerome, 
and Isaiah for sharing their wisdoms with us. I mean, the main thing that I've heard is representation counts, that these youth have the power, the authentic, genuine connections matter, kind of seizing the day, and um, just, you know, really following your dream, even, you know, don't, being, don't be turned off by the fact, you know, there's adultism is real. And people will tell you at 17, like, oh, you're just 17. But, like, standing in your power, I think, is everything. So I'm, I'm really inspired by you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, I keep my skin wet to enable respiration. Mm. Eat flies, fleas, and ticks without reservation. Okay. I sniff my way back here for Amplex's preservation uh. to restart the cycle that maintains my froggy nation because okay. I'm grown. Help me. Watch. ba da ba da what you do, Donna, returning the parvel of my life depends on you. Educate yourself. Protect me. That's